Well, Dan, yeah, thank this you so much. So much. I have no disagreement with, with any part of it. And I'm going to try to say a bit more about, about the questions you raise. Um, first of all, um, let me just drive home a point which you almost made but didn't quite. Um, I think we would all admit that if somebody decided to write a book about sweetness, about, about the quality of sweetness, doing their x-ray diffraction and looking at the, at the chemical structure of glucose would be looking in the wrong place. You're not going to find, you, if you scratch your head and say, what the heck? Why is this molecule, where's the ineffable sweetness come from? You're just looking in the wrong place. The sweetness has got to come out of an interaction with, with a perceiver. And indeed, the shape of the molecule is going to play a role in triggering the various things. We do, we do want to know the shape of the molecule. But if we scratch our head about, about how the sweetness resides in that shape. We're just, we're fooling ourselves. There's, there's no, there's no, uh, that's, a, that's a misguided question. Now, I just want to apply that, exactly that same message to our introspection of qualia in general. The ones, when we're, when we're interocepting, we make the same mistake, the same mistake if we sort of stare gobsmacked at the ineffable, intrinsic, whatever it is,ness of our qualia and say, well, golly, this is a mystery. I don't know how we can ever explain this. We're going to have to posit, you know, a pan proto realm or something like that to account for this. No, that's just the non-issue. What we have to account for is the set of reactive dispositions, which is, it, the trouble with the phrase, the set of reactive dispositions, is it sounds so behavioristic and so thin. But if you understand that this is a manifold of breathtaking complexity, this is like thousandfold, hundred thousandfold manifold, uh, and until you've got it all, you haven't got it all, uh, then, then the view doesn't look so thin. We're going to explain the uh, that wonderful subjective red in the same way we explain the, uh, the, the excellent taste of the honey. Um, yeah, I've got I've to talk about um, qualia surprise. That's, thank you. That's, that's good. Notice, by the way, how nicely, uh, now that Andy's raised that issue, how nicely this plays into an account of Mary the color scientist. Uh, uh, what we need, what, what she needs to know about, and I don't see why she can't, is that manifold of dispositions that would be caused in somebody, and in particular, it better be her, because people are not the same in all of their dispositions. And if she really knows, as Jackson says, all the physical facts, then she knows all that. So she will not be surprised when she sees a red thing. She's already predicted all of her reactions, and sure enough. And if you want an example of what that's like, think of this. Have you ever been tickled on the left ear with the tines of a fork? Probably not. Now, there you are. You've spent your whole life in the forkless, tickleless room, and now, you're released, and the first thing that somebody does is tickles you on the ear with the tines of a fork. Are you surprised? No. But why? Because it's so easy. You know, <laughs> well, for Mary, it's that easy. After all, she knows everything. So she's not surprised when she comes up. There's, there isn't any extra thing. Now, now, the trouble with Jackson's thought experiment, of course, or many things are wrong with it, and happily, Frank realizes that now. Uh, but one of the things is that the, is that the very assumption that she knows all the physical facts is so preposterously uh, unrealistic that nobody knows what follows from that. It's just, 
you should not trust your intuitions. If you think you have intuitions about what follows from, from somebody knowing all the facts about anything, try again. But I think you probably don't understand what the implications are. Here is a case where conceivability or inconceivability is a life's work. It's not something you just screw up your head and think about it for a few seconds. Oh, yeah, I can conceive that. No, you can't. No, you can't. If you think you can, you're simply underestimating the problem. Um, another way of putting the, the challenge that, that Andy puts at the end is, in Salarzian terms, why is our manifest image manifest? Manifest to us. Um, the things that our manifest image is populated with are largely and primarily the affordances in Gibsonian terms that matter to us getting through life, including inner affordances, knowing what to do in your own mind when you need to think of somebody's name and all the rest. So, but why, why isn't it dark? Why, why, why is it manifest to us? Because after all, we could, we could, uh, we, I use the example of an elevator. It's got a bunch of affordances, but the affordances aren't manifest to the elevator. Maybe they are to the elevator designer, but not to the elevator. It doesn't need to have any, any special access to its own, to its own affordances other than just its capacity to do the jobs it's designed to do. And here's where the, the, the second level expectation comes, if it comes at all. I just said, why is our manifest image manifest to us? And I did mean us in a rather special sense. I meant you and me together. I'm talking about, if you like, the second person point of view, the role that interlocutors play in tuning up and training our own access to our own minds. It's, it's because of our conversational, communicative upbringing, talking about what it's like to be us, being asking, you know, are you in pain? What's, what does that, hey, did you see what I just saw? All of this communal comparison is tuning up the coarseness, the dimensionality of the user interface in the same way that using a laptop, the, the, the computer engineers have done a brilliant job designing a user-friendly user interface, uh, the, sometimes called the user illusion. In a good sense, though, this isn't an evil thing. This is a very handy illusion. And number of people, myself first, I think, picked up on the idea of a user consciousness being, as it were, the brain's user illusion of itself. But why does the brain need a user illusion of itself? Because my brain needs a user illusion of Andy's brain, which needs a user illusion of my brain. And in the process of comparing notes and learning to, to compare our own reactions to things, we prune and shape the categories so that they are maximally portable, maximally exchangeable. And when somebody says, oh, it's ineffable, they are encountering the limits of that process. Those are temporary limits. You can, you can train yourself and your, and your compatriots to, to go up a few notches, to take apart some of the qualia, some of the ineffable intrinsic uh, uh, atomic to introspection qualia and render them molecular, not, not just atomic to introspection, but r render them uh, structured and having parts. At any time, there is the current lingua franca that we have available when we are heterophenomenological subjects, when we are being interrogated by others, and that and the limit to our capacity at any time to analyze further, that creates qualia 
this is, I think, a phrase from, from Keith. Uh, uh, as artifacts of the limits of our knowledge. I think in the same way that the sweetness quality is a sort of artifact of the limits of our knowledge um, evolutionarily, uh, we, don't, we don't need, compare it to the point that Bill Wimsatt made years ago about uh, the difference between an anteater and an insectivorous bird. For an anteater with a big sticky tongue, ant is a sort of mass term. Just sweep up some ant. You don't have, the, the anteater doesn't have to, have to uh, track the individual ants the way an insectivorous bird catching flying insects does have to track the individuals. The, the ontology for the anteater is simplified. It has a mass term where the insectivorous bird has a sortal. That's a complex function of the equipment. It's got the tools it's got to do the job it has to do to stay alive. If you don't need a sortal, if you can get by with a mass term, nature gives you a mass term. We don't distinguish individual water molecules. It's all just water to us. And similarly, we are not equipped natively to decompose, deconstruct the complex structures that Paul talks about that are driving our bodies through their responses to all the things we see in the world. That's a good place to stop and open for discussion, I think.